tragic and bitter battle to keep him alive reverberating across the world. The toddler had spent the last 18 months of his life in intensive care, being treated for a rare degenerative brain disorder. If a society is best judged by the quality of its mercy, well, Britain's socialized medical system appears to be failing that test. Diagnosed with a rare brain condition which doctors said was impossible to treat, arguing in court that he should be taken off life support, his parents fighting back. No one, and I repeat, no one in this country has taken my boy away from me. But a judge ruled in the local doctor's favour to end his suffering a move condemned by officials in the largely Catholic Poland who criticized the health service in the United Kingdom. He was taken off life support by court order on Monday. Yesterday, an appeals court refused to let Alfie's parents take him to Italy, which is offering an alternative treatment and citizenship. A Vatican hospital offering to treat the toddler. But those efforts rejected by courts, who ruled there was no prospect of recovery. There was a picture yesterday of this hospital, Alder Hay Hospital in the northwest of England, with 20 uniformed police officers standing outside the door of the hospital to stop little Alfie being taken out and to stop protesters from getting in, using the police to keep the child in the hospital. It's the second time in less than a year a UK judge ruled a child be taken off life support. Who died in London last year. A court denying his parents' petition to take him to America for experimental treatment. Mourners gathered to pay their respect to Alfie Evans' short life. But his death has reignited an international debate over who should decide for end-of-life care for sick children. So this gets to the absolute heart of how much freedom does the individual have? How much decision-making process do the parents have? Yeah. Or are our children now owned by the state? Frankly, what is happening today, what is happening right now, is a form of state-sponsored euthanasia, and I hate it. This next story sounds like it comes straight out of some dark science fiction novel, but it's unfortunately part of the culture of death today. At a funeral fair in Amsterdam last week, that's right, a funeral fair, a well-known euthanasia advocate unveiled a suicide machine. Visitors to the fair used virtual reality glasses to simulate the experience. Mishka and Dutch designer Alexander Banning hope to build the first functioning Sarco by the end of the year. Philip Nishka unveiled his so-called suicide machine at a funeral fair in Amsterdam last week. My designer, Alexander, who's come over all the way from the Netherlands, uh, has been involved in a very important aspect of the Sarko, which is that it can be 3D printed. So that's the, uh, that's the device. Uh, seen here uh, uh, depicted at sunrise uh, in some uh, field and I guess you can put the device wherever you like really you can uh, take it up and park it on the cliffs overlooking the Pacific I guess uh, waiting for the sunset but once you climb into the Sarko and press the button you will peacefully die in the same way I guess as a roller coaster with euphoria and I would suggest elegance. Philip Nitsky designed what he's calling the Sarko. The Sarko capsule comes with a detachable coffin and a hookup for a nitrogen container. And what's a devastating invention, if someone wants to commit suicide, they go in the Sarko capsule, press a button, and they are killed once it's filled with nitrogen. This euthanasia advocate, Philip Nitsky, said as a medical student, he was inspired by Jack Kevorkian, or Dr. Death, who assisted in at least 130 suicides. But doctors are not meant to kill. No one is. Anyone who can climb into this machine and press a button inside will peacefully die. Now, Alex, say a few words, please. Uh, this was probably the one 
uh, assignment that I didn't see coming and it took a little while for me in order to know for myself if I wanted to help because this subject for you is all very natural and it's uh, well embedded in your life a, a con contained area which is the base which has a little area which pulls back out and you can fill it up with liquid nitrogen in a special thermos flask then it's loaded a person when they satisfy the security requirements and I'll say a little bit more that, about that later get into the machine the canopy closes if they press the button inside no one else can press it, it has to be pressed from inside the liquid nitrogen floods out across a series of evap evaporators in the base here and boils rapidly and what happens is that there's a sudden movement of gas into this top part it pushes the air out and we've done tests monitoring the oxygen level and it drops down to levels which would bring quick loss of consciousness in less than a minute it's rapid and so a person in there would experience a short period of uh, euphoria perhaps certainly not a painful experience before they lost consciousness and then they're effectively in a zero oxygen environment and so death follows within a few minutes one biomedical ethics professor and a member of the Pontifical Academy for Life, Daniel Solmasi, criticized this invention as bad medicine, ethics, and bad public policy. Solmasi told Newsweek, it converts killing into a form of healing and doesn't acknowledge that we can now do more for symptoms through palliative care than ever before. Uh, I thought to myself, I can see a world, I can see a world where people who want a peaceful death, reliable at the time of their choosing, should be able to have that option. And I can see something like this for common use as a way of solving that issue. It emerged that Australia's most controversial euthanasia activist is linked to the deaths of three women at Ephraim Island. An elderly mother and her two daughters are suspected of making a suicide pact following contact with Philip Nitschke. An elderly Harvey Bay couple has died in one of two apparent suicide packs in just two days. The couple aged in their 60s took their own lives last night. On Wednesday, police in Mooloolaba found the bodies of another couple. Authorities believe their death was carefully planned after attending assisted suicide workshops hosted by controversial euthanasia advocate Dr Philip Nitschke. He's lab tested most options and number one on Nitschke's list. The premier drug for ending life is Nimbutel, the barbiturate. And Nitschke, predictably dubbed Dr. Death in the press, is selling Nembutol testing kits. The amount needed to turn it back into a colourless liquid gives you an idea of what the strength of the Nembutel must have been in this bottle. But this is information, not encouragement. I would argue that. Nambutol is, is available in Mexico, and Nitschke has accompanied terminally ill patients to buy the drug. $30 a bottle, no questions asked. You pour it into a glass and you drink it, you follow it up with your whiskey, and I've never seen anyone finish their whiskey. They put the glass down and they're gone, gone to sleep, and death follows shortly thereafter. To the outside observer, nothing looks more peaceful. And inside? We may never know. We may never know. Are you religious? No. At all? No. Creating a suicide machine sends the message that some people are better off dead. But we know that's not the truth. As long as you have a beat in your heart, a breath in your lungs, as long as you've got life in you, know that the author of life, God our Father, has a purpose for you here today. But our next guest reminds us of that same essential message using her own words today. Leah Darrow is a former model and author of the new book, The Other Side of Beauty. You know, Leah, on EWTM Pro Life Weekly, we often are addressing abortion, but mm -hmm. abortion, contraception, cohabitation, they're all connected to the body. Absolutely, there's a huge connection, and, and I think anybody of faith knows that. Cohabitation, you know, sex outside of marriage, abortion, contraception, all of these things have been brought into our world in some effort to liberate us. But we've never asked from what? And we never mm -hmm. asked, who is the one saying this? 
Mm-hmm. And there is a voice in this world that wants to liberate us in a sense from truth, from God. Mm-hmm. And that voice does not come from God. That voice is evil. Mm-hmm. They know the connection of when we when we don't define love in light of Christ, then things start to break down. Mm-hmm. We allow ourselves to be used for the sake of love. We've made our bodies in particular idols. They're golden calves everywhere. We worship them. I mean, how often do we really think about our spiritual life? Mm -hmm. How often do we think about our soul? You know, I I mean, so often, you know, we could get on the scale and see the progress that we've made. What if we got on the scale and it told us the progress of our soul? Mm 